And uh, at this time, we're going to introduce a couple of guests. It's Larry, L Larry Penner from the Gideons. Uh, it's a wonderful way of telling the world about Jesus. I stood on the sidewalk last October, early in October on a morning like this, in front of Park Rose High School with three other Gideons, and we started to hand out testaments to the students as they arrived at school. A guy drove by in a car while I was standing there, and he yelled out of his car, quit proselytizing the kids, you creep. So I got in my car and drove home. No. No, you knew, you knew I didn't do that. The reason we were there in Portland, Portland doesn't have enough Gideons, and about every five years or so, they have something they call a Bible Blitz, and they get Gideons from all over the state, and other states as well, to come to Portland and help them hand out Bibles. And uh, one of the guys, one of the three guys, was actually from Minnesota that morning. And by the end of the week up in Portland, the Gideons had given out 21,000 Bibles across the city. And that day at Park Rose High School, the rest of the students arrived at school and we handed out, the four of us, 130 testaments that morning to high school students. One week later, I was on the Oregon State University campus and we were there uh, standing in the rain with several Gideons across the campus and uh, normally we hand out green testaments to, high, to college students but these, these don't go very well at Oregon State. <laughs> so uh, we, we, hand, we hand out the orange, the orange Testaments there at Oregon State. They say the same thing inside. <laughs> there were several of us Gideons on campus, but there was uh, one man across the street from me there in front of the administration building, and we stood there in the rain all morning long and handed out 200 testaments that morning. So the Gideons have one goal, and they are Christian businessmen and professionals, and we have one goal, that's to win people to Christ through personal testimony and by giving out Bibles and testaments in the traffic lanes of life. Hotels and motels, schools, colleges, medical offices, hospitals, jails, military installations. And you might ask, well, just how well does that work? Um, how do you know that people are doing anything with those testaments? And so that's why the Gideons bring to you stories of personal people that come to the Lord because of those testaments. In 2010, I was doing a Bible Blitz in New York City. And I had an opportunity to speak at a church there called New Life in the Bronx. And it was a small little church. Um, most of the people in that church were from uh, immigrants from uh, Caribbean islands. And they invited me to have potluck with them afterwards. And I, I joined them. And I, I noticed in the stew, I saw some fish eyes looking up at me. There was a man that came up to me that morning. His name was Christopher Stewart, and he told me that he had received a testament right after high school in 1988. And he had immediately gone on the sea train on the way home and started reading that testament right away. And as a result, he had come to the Lord and became a Christian. And here he was, 22 years later, in 2010 with a wife and two kids in that church worshiping Jesus Christ as his Savior. Applause 
There was a man named Kevin, a boy named Kevin, and he had a twin brother. And he decided, he and his twin brother decided that they were going to be atheists. They were going to be experts about it. They were going to know all the answers. At age 16, they studied up on it, and they were going to be uh, expert atheists, uh, much to the dismay of their parents. And they went to uh, University of Wisconsin at Madison. And one morning, the Gideons were there on campus, and the Gideons had the testaments, and uh, Kevin was offered one, and he rudely turned it down. And he started walking up toward his class up the hill, and about 50 yards later, there was another Gideon that offered him a testament, and he turned it down. And by the time he got to the third one, they, they wore him down, and he accepted the testament that morning, and he started reading it right away. And the Holy Spirit spoke to him, and he came to Jesus Christ as his Savior. And his first thought after he accepted Jesus was, my twin brother, I got to tell him. And so he went home right away, and he went to his brother's bedroom, and there was his brother on his knees in front of the bed with the testament opened. He, too, had come to Christ that same day. And Kevin has since become a pastor at a church. I want to bring to you a couple of testimonies. I'm sure that you have heard them before. I know that John was here last year. And so it's more about letting you know, well, what happened after that? Uh, one of the testimonies that we have come to know about in recent years is a, uh, Craig Groeschel, who is a celebrity uh, in Christian circles. And uh, he was a, a party boy in a fraternity, and he got his hands on one of those Gideon's Testaments and uh, eventually came to Jesus as his Savior. And what I wanted to let you know, um, rather than telling you the story about him, is to let you know what he's doing now. And so I looked up his website. He has become a pastor since then. He started Life Church, and I looked it up. There are now 45 satellite churches in 12 separate states that are part of Life Church. Uh, he does training on leadership. I have run into several pastors in the town who uh, have listened to his podcasts on leadership. And he, uh, in his church, started the U version of the Bible when it first became available on iPhones. And some of you, I'm sure, have that app on your phone. And so I looked it up to see how many downloads there are. 705 million downloads of God's Word on the U version. And all of this was because one Gideon was at his college and handed him a testament as he came out of class. A seed that was planted has resulted in a lot of fruit. Another one who I would call a Christian celebrity, a man named Christopher Yuan, and he was uh, a guy that was a homosexual, and he came out of the closet and, uh, and disappointed his parents, and uh, he became a... He was in dental school. He was going to become a dentist. And then he got caught dealing drugs while he was uh, at dental school, and he ended up in prison. And, uh, you know, his whole life was falling apart. And as a result, his parents came, uh, his mo mother in particular came to the Lord as a result of the desperation of what she saw in his life. And eventually, in that jail... He found a Gideon Bible, a Gideon Testament in the trash can in the jail and picked it up. And even though he had been violently opposed to anything having to do with Christianity, God's word broke down the barriers and spoke to him. And he came to the Lord as his savior. He is also, I would call him, a celebrity. He does speaking engagements all around the country on the, on the subject of biblical sexuality and the gospel and there are many 
people, young people especially nowadays, that are very confused on this topic, and they need solid Bible teaching. And he has a, a, young, a video series for teenage young adults. And I, I looked it up. Just in the August and September this year, he's done eight public speaking engagements in large venues. Again, one seed planted, this case, in a jail by Gideons, and it results in an enormous harvest. We have a, a local guy who uh, is not a Gideon. He is a, a friend of the Gideon, which any of you can join, the Friends of the Gideons. And his name is Andre, and I'm sure some of you know Andre. <clears throat> and he told me that he went to Hilo, Hawaii in November, I think it was 2020, just a few years ago. Uh, and he was praying as he walked for an opportunity to share Jesus. And he had a Gideon Testament with him and a tract. And a man stuck his head out of a house. And he yelled, hey, want some weed? Andre says, no, but I have a gift for you. Come out here to the curb and let me give it to you. So the man came out of his house, sat down on the curb with Andre for about an hour as he opened up God's word and shared God's word with him. The man showed him that he was, had been in a gang and that he had scars from the gang fights and bullet wounds, and that he had been uh, an addict. And he said, well, let me think about it, after Andre spoke with him and shared God's word. And so he went home that night, and then he texted Andre the next morning that he had come to Christ. And he says, can you tell my brother about Jesus? And so... Andre went through the same thing with his brother the next day and led him to Christ as well with a Gideon Testament. Both of those, he has, Andre has been in contact with them since then. They have joined a local church in Hawaii and they have been baptized. And so these are lives that are really changed for the Lord. I know that you, some of you know uh, Jean Hebert, who has spoken here before, and Jean has a fresh testimony that I'm going to share for you. Uh, it regards, uh, in March of 2022, two years ago, Jean was down in Southern California in the Palm Springs area, and he gave out testaments to two young guys. They were uh, 15 years old, in front of a storefront. And Gene had put inside the Testament just a little piece of paper with his name and his cell phone number and said, you know, if you want to contact me, here's my number. Five months later, Gene received a text from that young man. His name was Jaden. And here's what the text said. It included these words, thank you very much. I have been depressed and angry. You helped me start my journey on worshiping God. And they started to have a regular back and forth by text as he started on his spiritual journey. Jaden did. And in 2023, one year later, Gene asked him by text to go to church on Easter and his, the reply was, I've been going to church with my aunt. And so he had not been going to church with his parents, but his aunt took him to church. And then Gene did not hear from him for a while. And in June this year, just a couple of months ago, Gene got a call from Jaden's dad. And he informed Gene that Jaden had been killed at his high school prom. And after the fact, they found on his cell phone these texts between him and Gene. And so they had a memorial service for Jaden, 
And I have listened to that memorial service, and in it, the pastor tells the 500 people there at the memorial service that Jaden had come to the Lord and become a Christian because of this testament that he'd gotten from this man in Oregon named Gene. Very, very um, compelling to listen to that memorial service. I want to re remind you that we, uh, in, in addition to going to other places and doing, uh, spreading God's word, uh, we work hard in Albany to make sure that everybody gets a Bible around here. Um, Lynn Benton Community College is one of our places that we are regularly at. Uh, Twelve times last year we were at a table in, uh, and handed out 217 testaments during the course of last year. And then recently we were at the Lynn County Fair and we handed out 800 testaments at the Lynn County Fair. Many of these kids, we don't get a chance to hand them a testament at the high schools and middle schools because maybe they get on a bus, but we catch some of them at the Lynn County Fair, and it's our opportunity to do that. There's also the Willamette Sportsman Show. We gave out 199 testaments. In all of the Albany schools, the middle schools and high school, we gave out 452 testaments this year. So... A uh, couple hundred countries around the world that the Gideons are active in, and uh, we use donations from churches and so on to help us to facilitate that uh, because many of these countries can't buy their own scriptures. And so that's one thing that, that we ask from you is to partner with us and help us financially as you pray with us that you can give as well. And I'll be prepared at the end of the service today to, uh, I'll have an open Bible, and you can make some donations and help us to buy those testaments. Uh, I also want to make a pitch to you that some of you men, and, uh, and maybe your wife can kind of poke you in the ribs, that you ought to be a Gideon. And so consider joining the Gideons if you are a Christian businessman or professional, and talk to me afterwards about, what, about you becoming a Gideon as well. Uh, we need more, and we especially need younger guys, and uh, they're, they're, God may be speaking to you right now about that. So thank you so much for partnering with us in this church, and as you have for several years, and we uh, appreciate everything you do for us. Isn't that exciting? I'm... A still collecting myself after that Jaden testimony. Wasn't that powerful? I love to have um, just sharing what is happening in our local community with ministries in our local, um, just Albany. And you guys, I don't know if you know Gene by name, but you definitely know Gene. You've seen Gene. He's been here many times. And um, Gene, and it used to be Ardell, uh, I feel like they were at every community event. And um, we had the Gideons here with us, actually, for the Christmas giveaway. And um, they were part of it. And they were at the very tail end. And while people were waiting for their gifts, they went faithfully to every car. Do you have a Bible? Do you know Jesus? And at that event and alone, seven people made the decision to receive Christ. And so they receive the best gift. So I love to have the Gideons come and share. And so Larry, thank you so much for sharing. Um, this morning, you have a little handout that we gave you. But yeah, Larry's going to be at the end of service. He's going to be standing at one of those tables with an open Bible. And that's just part of why they come to share what God's doing, but also so that we can sew in because they use all the money to purchase more testaments. So you are sowing seed to go all over the world. And it's so important. So important. Guess what? I have no idea <laughs> what's up this morning. I've had like three words rolling around in my spirit all week. And I, I literally, even to right now in this moment, I'm like, God, what are you doing? <laughs> 
It doesn't happen very often. But I think, I don't think I've ever read my message before. And this was not even one of the three messages that was rolling around in my spirit, but I found this yesterday. And it's something I wrote seven years ago, almost to the day. And um, it's, I feel like it's a testimony. It was of something that God has started in us as a community. And here we are seven years later. And one of my favorite scriptures is in Deuteronomy where it says, at the end of seven years, all debts are paid. You know, it's this whole thing of jubilee. Um, and this actually has nothing to do with debt, but I just feel like there's something of this at the end of seven year cycle when I read this. There's something of jubilee for us. We're, we're really in so much transition, you know that, as a church community. And, um, you know, I've already shared that whole message of what it looks like. God has something for us in the middle of transition or the hallway, as we've been calling it, you know. We've stepped outside of one door. We have yet to be able to enter into the next door. We're in this in-between space. And it's not a wasted time. It is God is doing something in us for where he's leading us. But if you will just bear with me this morning, you get to hear the thoughts and the stirrings of a much younger 40-year-old woman um, way before I was 47. And um, I'm just saying that because it was my birthday last week and we all joked about how old I am. I'm so young, seven years ago, just turned 40. Actually, I hadn't even turned 40 yet because I wrote this in July. I was 39 still. So, so young, so fresh. <laughs> anyway, it was my musings with the Lord. The Godhead has been speaking to me this past year about a shift that's coming for our church. To really get back to the simplicity of the gospel, the works and the message of Jesus. I've known that church as we know it will look different. I've been wrestling big time with this thing that I know that's inside of me because I know God loves the church. He loves her. He loves the gathering together of believers. He loves when we all come together in unity to worship him together in spirit and truth. He believes in his church as the organism and the structure rather than an organization. He believes in this company of people who will come together and turn the world upside down. I know this because you can see it all throughout his New Testament. Paul's role was to teach and encourage and to strengthen the church, but why? Why was that his role? Was it for us to create this whole bless me club to grow bigger and bigger and bigger? To create this sort of elitist mentality to create an environment for that to grow effectively? I think not. When I look at the Big C Church, I wonder, just as much as I love the church, how the heck did we become like this? All our titles and business cards and our who's who in the Christian zoo, apostle so-and-so and prophet such-and-such. Such. Hear me, please. I'm not desiring to be disrespectful because these people are my friends and these people are me. They are good, amazing, God-loving, laying down their lives for the sake of the kingdom kind of God people. They are incredible and God loves them. I'm not speaking disrespectfully of individuals, but if there's anywhere, I gotta understand what I wrote, but if there's anywhere it would, that I would be disrespectful at, it would be the culture that we've created in the body of Christ, where we elevate folks to celebrity status and make the mark of someone having arrived in the kingdom or gaining some type of title or reputation. This sounds a lot like my message last Sunday. <laughs> Who has the most Instagram followers? 
Who has the most invitations to speak at conferences? Who has the most cutting edge church or the best conference, best books selling? Those deep one-liners, those tweetable quotes. The truth is that the stuff, that this stuff isn't the kingdom of God. There is incredible stuff that happens in those environments and through those people's lives, but the hoopla that surrounds them, this isn't the mark of having made it in the kingdom. And I'm part of the machine. I get invitations to speak. You guys, this is my journal, okay? I get them more and more, and there is this thing inside of me that happens when I get those invitations that says, wow, I must be doing something right. I better keep doing that. Or in the same respect, when the invitations slow down and people aren't commenting on how great you are or whatever you assume that you must not be doing the right thing. This is messed up. The church was always meant to be a family, a reflection of God's great kingdom, where he is our father. And we all have relationship with him through his son, Jesus. And Holy Spirit lives in us and guides us into all truth and helps each of us advance the kingdom and bring others into the same relationship that we experience with the Godhead. Okay, I have to blink because my tears are blocking my vision. There are times when the church is meant to be a legislative body where the family joins together in unity and legislates things on earth as it is in heaven. But the church was never meant to be a rat race, a hierarchy, or a business model for us to climb the ladder of success. That's not to say that there aren't leaders, etc., that there aren't, that there isn't this happening in leaders. So don't hear me wrong. Families have leadership. Anyway, I wrote that. Anyway, I was 39, you know. And then there's the consumerism that plagues our Western church greatly. Get your staff in place, provide programs and mechanisms for everything, including outreach, a service project. I wonder what would happen if we let all our staff go <laughs> and everything else was just the whole church pitching in and doing this stuff together. Or would it even get done? How many people would still be here? Is that the right thing to do? I'm not sure. But this is the thing. With all of that said, I find that much of what we do here, even in our church, amongst our staff, how much time is spent on keeping saints happy, ministering to needs of people, and pointing our time and efforts towards creating a great Sunday morning experience for everyone. That's good, we should do those things. But should that be our primary focus? I actually don't think so. Wow, this is a big rant. But this is what's swirling around in my pastor heart these days. It started kind of small and now it's a raging fire. How will we make the shift? How will we do this in a way that doesn't kill the good things that have been established that should stay? How will we swing the pendulum without going too far to the other extreme? John 1, 14. The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. We saw the glory with our own eyes. The one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. What will happen when Jesus moves into the neighborhood? <laughs> Jesus was living in the neighborhood for 30 years before anyone took notice of him as a minister. Before anything remarkable or extraordinary happened, he was in and among the people for 30 years. He was a carpenter. He was a son. He was a friend. And even after he started doing miracles and people started taking notice, he still lived among them. He loved the people. He served the people. He healed the people. He ate with them. He partied with them. He walked the city streets. What would happen 
if our church didn't exist anymore, would it make a difference to our city? Would anyone notice? What happens if I move out of my neighborhood? Would my neighbors notice and would it matter? I'm the light of the world. You are the light of the world, a city on a hill that cannot be hidden. Who is my neighbor? I'm sorry, I'm just reading. First Corinthians 13 speaks of all these things that we hold dearly, things that we do. And then it says, if you don't have love, what does it mean? I was thinking about this portion of scripture in light of what it would look like when Jesus moved into the neighborhood and I had this come to mind. If I rewrote this scripture, it would say maybe something like, if I hosted conferences that drew crowds of thousands, but I didn't love my neighbor, I'm a clinging gong. If I can prophesy on demand, but I never speak God's heart to a stranger, I'm just noise. If the world knew the name of my church for a powerful outpouring of the spirit, but my city remains broken, where's the glory in that? You get the idea. Love looks like something. It's super important to love one another here in this safe place at church. It's super important to take care of one another, to learn to prophesy, to heal the sick, have incredible faith, grow in knowledge and revelation from heaven, to be a family in and amongst ourselves. But we have to be like Jesus. We have to move into the neighborhood. That's what he did. And that's where his impact came from in his life. The truth is Jesus lived in the neighborhood I apparently had to say that thought again. He had a family. What does it look like for Jesus' pursuit as a collective family to be flesh and blood and move into a neighborhood, which is what we did when we planted this church? What does it look like for me? What does it look like for our church as individuals, our family units, to move into the neighborhood? What does it look like? If we moved, would it matter to our neighbors? I want to know, can we have it all? Can we be people that press into a prophetic stream, are a prophetic people? Can we be the ones who press in for signs and wonders, who become a, a people of miracles and faith? Could we be a people who press in to grow in the word, together providing community, a place where people can be fed and iron sharpens iron? And... We have a Sunday morning celebration where we come together and celebrate the goodness of God that we've experienced all week together and in unity worship this amazing God that we love and be flesh and blood in the neighborhood and love our city at the same time. I believe it doesn't have to be one or the other. It gets to be both and. We can be an apostolic resource to the nations and a family that sows into a city that we live in and shifts the atmosphere and expresses Jesus here in Albany. This is my question. I wanna hear what the Spirit would say to me. How do I really move into my neighborhood? How do we do this as a church? And how do I do this with my own family? The end. So that was seven years ago in July. And then I see us, here we are. We haven't fired all the staff. <laughs> but many have just transitioned because God is leading them a different way. We are not who we were seven years ago. We sold it all to buy a field in a neighborhood. And I just, I, this is not a message. This is a testimony. I had to read 39-year-old Emily's thoughts. I feel like it's a testimony. Because we as a, as a family, we are still in the middle of what does it look like 
to do this. But a lot of the questions of like, how did we get here? I think that has been settled in our hearts. This is who we are, and this is where we're going. And we'll give it all away for Jesus. And I, I believe the both and is our portion. A supernatural family who digs deep. One of the messages that I was going to share is what it looks like to live in a healthy prophetic culture. That's so important to us as a community. That's who we are. All those gifts are good. Paul said to eagerly pursue the gifts. Yeah. And especially prophecy. We got to put love as the glue in all of that. And I think that's what we've been learning to do these last years. So I just want to say love is being built in us. And this whole thing of being willing to risk it all to be like Jesus, I just love you guys. <laughs> I'm so thankful for a radical family. Like when we came and said, I think this is something God is doing in December. I mean, I think there were some questions like, what are we going to do? And where, why would we do that? But then when it was like, okay, here's the vision is like, yeah, let's sell it all. What good is our history if it's just a story we tell? It's meant to be a launching pad for the future of what God wants to do. His kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, in Albany as it is in heaven. And um, he's not done with us yet. We are literally moving into the neighborhood. I can't wait. Tuesday morning, truly, the walls start tumbling, tumbling down. Um, there is a, a hazardous materials company going in into the new building. And they're starting to do demo for all of the asbestos and all of those things. So you can pray for them. But um, it's starting, guys. It, we are in motion. We are on our way. If you don't know what I'm talking about, we sold this building, and we're renting this sanctuary space now, but we bought a new building and um, a new church. It's an old church, and it's in a neighborhood. It's a whole city block just in the middle of a neighborhood, and it's older, so it has things like asbestos. <laughs> and so that's going to get mitigated. Um, the board is working right now to um, finalize who is our contractor, their plans are at the city. The plan review is underway. The fee has been paid. Pray for grace over the city planners and all of those things. But it is in motion. The elevator is getting ordered this week. These are big things. It's underway. And it all started with, it didn't all start with the musings of a 39-year-old pastor. It was a culture, it was a prophetic community that's like, what are you saying, Lord? Where are you leading us? This is, this is what he's done inside of you. This is what he's done inside of each of us to say, let's, let's sell it all for the kingdom of God. See what he will do. Because I think we answered the question, what would happen if we went away? And whether seven years ago the city would have taken notice or not, I think we decided we're not going to let that be our story. We're going to make sure that Jesus is glorified, that his name is known, because we exist to know Jesus Christ and to make him famous, and to bring a demonstration of the good news of the kingdom, both in word 
and in demonstration, signs and wonders. This is, this is who you are. This is who we are. So, I don't know, does anybody else have a testimony of what God has been doing? I'm not talking about like you open an envelope and there was $100 in there. I'm talking about how you saw something that he has been doing in your heart. And now you're starting to walk in the promises of it. Yeah, come on. You got to stand right here so the camera can see. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I watched a um, a video the other day about, I don't know if anybody else saw it. Um, I think it was like three weeks ago. I was on YouTube wasting my time. And and uh, we married gay. I watched this thing. It was, we married gay, and it was a transvestite man and a homosexual man, and they met, and they fell in love, and they married. <laughs> so he married a woman. So it in, the, in their testimony, all the same. <laughs> All the say uh, that I have judgment in my heart and that um, I don't know God's plans. I don't know what he has for people. And that um, I can't work for him if I have that in my heart. Like, Today at the at the store, two women walked out, and I was just like, Ugh. and the Lord's like, I love them too, you know. And so, um, I don't know what it is. Well, I do know what it is. <laughs> My heart is just like, Ugh. it's just changing. Um, and it's it started in Africa, yeah. you know, that I got <laughs> get to go, I got to go to Africa, and God just loves everybody, and He wants me to love everybody. It's not my job to say, oh, because <laughs> I'm pretty sure people have said that about me. Like I can't believe they let her in there, <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, who am I? Who am I? And so um, I just know that God is just changing my heart, and it doesn't—it's uncomfortable, yeah. and it's messy, and I just remember coming in here high and dancing and waving flags, and I don't think I ever waved flags, but I was dancing over there all the time, and I was high, and I sat—I just thought I could sit right up here in the front row, <laughs> right next to everybody. And nobody ever said anything to me. And I need to, I forget that. That nobody said, oh, she can't come here. She's high, you know. I, and I want to be so, I so want to be in the neighborhood. God, I am so much part of that world. I am so much, God brought me clear out of it. That <laughs> uh, when I'm in Africa and I tell a woman that I'm, in recovery, she doesn't believe me. That's how far he's brought me out. (laughs) So, um, yeah, so it's messy, and I'm just really grateful that God is working in me. It doesn't feel good, but it's necessary. (laughs) It doesn't feel good, but it does feel good too, doesn't it? Yeah, to like get free from that. Um, How many of you remember Keith and Karen's word, like what was it, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, about getting comfortable with the mess. Is that what you titled it? Something? Get ready for messy. I'm so glad that Keith is in that stage of life that he could actually like speak to um, the, those that are in retirement. You know, because I'm not in that stage right now. But what an awesome challenge. 
And it's an awesome challenge to every single one of us, no matter what state of life we're in. We have to deal with our love of comfort. We have to deal with our love of being okay, satisfied, cozy, you know? If we don't, not only will we not be effective with where God's leading us, but with what is going to be coming in the days and years to come, just on the earth. We have to make a decision now, just like we have to make a decision now about the character choices that we're going to make before we're ever tested about them. Right? We talked about that last week. And if it gets easy to make little allowances here and there with things that we don't think are um, anybody sees or they maybe don't matter, it's going to be easier and easier for our conscience to be numbed, for us to just make excuses and push away the voice of Holy Spirit when he's saying, no, do this, do this. In the same way, we have to make a decision about comfort and ease no matter what time of life you're in. But I think there's a special um, challenge when you step into retirement, like this is my time. This is my me time. And I just wanna challenge you, like the Gideons are largely retired, right? Right now. Because they're like, we're not gonna, we're not gonna clip coupons and go to the early bird dinner <laughs> or travel there's nothing wrong with traveling in your RV. Like, do that. There's nothing wrong with vacations. Do that. But coasting your way out of life, don't do that. This is not retirement. We've been saying it. It is refirement. It is time for a refiring. This is your moment to shine. And for all of us that are in the slug and the, the grind of life and work, like, we need to be chasing you down. I want to see you say, catch me if you can. Do you have a testimony, Miss Rebecca? Okay. I'm not quite sure how to start this, but um, I've done some genealogy and some lineage kinds of things and found out we were Jewish, and then found out we were Jewish on both sides of the family. And what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> but what I, at my age, I'm beginning to understand what the Bible says about the turning away from the Lord, that that goes down to the third and the fourth generation. I'm the fourth generation. <laughs> And um, as a side note, I ran into, a, on, in genealogy, a relative who was in Dachau prison. And um, then there was the branch that came to the United States. And I don't know what happened to them. I, I, it, was so, it was so long ago, the early 1800s. But what I'm trying to say is, the Lord put upon me to seek him and to get out from under all the things in Deuteronomy 28, if you've read that, that talks about curses. And our family had all of that going on. And so I started in deliverance and inner healing in September of 1997. And I mean, the layers have gone on forever and ever and ever. And I said, Lord, when do we come to the end of the cesspool? <laughs> when do we come to the... And he started showing me recently, because I've chosen to follow him, that the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 are now in effect in my life. And there's no words to say you know, especially after being healed of such a dire mm. medical diagnosis, um, stage four cancer. 
and I'm healed. <laughs> and <laughs> I'm healed in the name of Jesus, I'm healed. Um, he brought that. And all of those blessings yeah. are starting to chase me down. <laughs> and all of my relatives who turn their back against Adonai, the Jewish traditions, um, it was something that they did not comprehend that the law was fulfilled in Yeshua, yeah. Jesus. The law is fulfilled in him and I am in him yeah. and he is in me and I have no righteousness except his blood washes me yeah. and the blood of bulls and goats doesn't cut it. Yeah, exactly. And when, I, when I've read that initially, I thought the blood of bulls and goats, oh yeah, the sacrifice in the temple, sure, sure, I get it. Um, no, <laughs> it's not just that. But there are blood sacrifices in a very dark place. And when you're confronted with that darkness and the, and the sacrifices that the occult practitioners in the occult world, and you become aware of those, then what do you do? <laughs> you know? The blood of Jesus. Then what happens is exactly the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth who came in the flesh. It is his blood that cancels out all of that darkness that washes me in his blood and makes me clean, clean as wool, you know, is the, the saying. And I'm not ashamed. There are people who might be ashamed of being Jewish. Mm -hmm. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, I wear it and I'm grateful for those who went before me. Um, but I'm hoping that those who came to the United States in the early 1800s, they were in Pennsylvania. So I'm hoping maybe some of the Amish or the Shakers got a hold of them. <laughs> and that I will one day meet them in heaven, <laughs> you know. Um, and that's my hope, that Jesus has done that and gone before us yeah. and created a way where there is no way. <laughs> but he is Haderek, the way. He is, in Hebrew, the way is Haderek. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Well, the blessings of Deuteronomy 28 are for all of us. This has been a very different Sunday. We don't normally do this at all. Um, I, I, just, I just wanted to share what I, I believe is a testimony and um, of what God has done, what he's doing, what he's yet to do, and just remind us of kind of how this started, this shift of, well, we've had a major shift as a community of what we're going after and um, how we're doing it. And it hasn't been for everyone, but I know that what the seed that we're sowing is gonna reap a harvest. And so I just want to honor um, what God has been doing, not just here in Jesus' pursuit. He's doing it in his church. And um, his glory is coming. It's here. But it's coming in an even greater measure. measure. And um, I'm just excited for this year to see a lot of these things begin to come into formation. And um, we're getting ready to start. I mean, it's Labor Day on Monday, tomorrow. It's a whole new school year. I don't know. This is my first year of not having someone in school other than, I mean, they're going to go to college, but like high school, there's no like high school sports. There's no college sports anymore. Like, Life has changed for me. It's changed for many of you long ago, and some of you are still in that 
um, young kids and doing that whole thing, but it feels like the beginning of a new year in September. And all the teachers' heads are nodding. You know, it just, and it just feels like that. And so we are in, we are in a new season. And we are entering into a new year. And God, I just want to thank you um, that you're helping us get rid of our need for comfort and get ready for messy, messy services, messy people, our own internal things, whether it's judgment or relational things that you're healing us from. When your spirit comes and makes a mess and we go, oh, I've never seen that before. I'm uncomfortable. For when the political stuff is going on and we're uncomfortable. Lord, I thank you that you are um, setting us in a right spirit and our minds in a right state of mind, that we have the mind of Christ. Lord, that you're going after all ungodly beliefs and that you are dethroning um, those lies and principalities that would come against the truth. And we thank you, Lord, that you are replacing all of that with truth. And the biggest truth over everything is that you are good and that you are good and that you are good. You are good, Lord. And you have good things in, in store for this community, for your people, for this nation. Lord, I thank you um, just for the testimonies of the word of God going out with the Gideons, Lord, but also with us. We are all enlisted. We can all share the word. We can all be ready walking on a beach in Hilo or going into the store. No matter what we're doing, we, are, we can be ready to, to introduce people to Christ. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't leave this place and forget who we are through the week, but Lord, this would just be that igniting fire that would send us out. And Lord, I pray for your word to go forth more and more and more in Albany, in the Northwest, Lord, and all over the nation and the nations, God. Lord, I thank you that you love us too much to leave us where we've been and that you are moving us. And Lord, we thank you for the neighborhood. We ask God that you would begin to stir our hearts for the people in that place, for the people that reside in those homes, for their lives, for their stories, for their souls, Lord. Just give us eyes to see and hearts, Lord, that are connected to your heart to see people the way that you see them. Lord, I thank you that we who have been forgiven much can now love much. And we love you, Jesus. You're beautiful. We sang it this morning. God, we say it again. You are beautiful. There's no one like you, Jesus. There's no one like you, Jesus. Thank you. You have redeemed us. You have called us by name. God, it's your kindness that has led each one of us to repentance. And Lord, I pray that your kindness and your goodness would lead us on today, Lord, the rest of this week, till we come back together again, that we can celebrate and testify of your goodness again. We love you, Jesus. Amen. <laughs>